You're listening to Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever, recorded on location from Ryan's house in Chicago. My name is Matt K, and with me is... Ry the Movie Guy, and sitting right to my right is... Fill me in, Phil. Hello, hello, hello. This week on Cinema Jaw, Matt, we turn off the lights and we talk about Stephen King as we discuss our top five favorite scenes from Stephen King movies. This reminds me, I wanted to ask you after the film, are you afraid of the dark? No. I, I mean, mean not okay, now. not now as an adult, but like when you were a little oh, kid. Oh, 100%. And I, I talked a little bit about it when we talked about the movie Skinamarink. Um, it's come up a few times that this is a release that came out earlier this year that really captured that, that fear, that fear. And yes, I had it. I almost forgot it as an adult that I had that fear as a kid. Skidamarink brought that back. And I remembered being scared of the dark when I would wake up in the middle of the night. Okay. So scared of the dark is a, is a small piece of the boogeyman, but, but here's an, uh, another one. That's a bigger piece. It's right in the trailer. What about the thing under your bed? Were you ever afraid of the area under your bed? Not a hundred percent like they are in, in the boogeyman in the movie or how some kids are a little bit though at times like you'd hear something and you'd think maybe, you know, there was a chance there was something underneath the bed, but was I ever really afraid of that? No, you No, no, not at all. I was the thing under the bed. <laughs> I mean, I, what I remember actually being a little kid was uh, right around like Halloween season, trying to make a, a haunted house under my bed. Really? Right. It was so bizarre. I would go underneath there and I would hang things. You know, oh yeah, from, totally like, the like a pillow board. fort. Like, yeah, there'd yeah. be stuff, but it would be all underneath my bed, and no one could go under. You know, but I'm a you. little kid. Yeah, and I'd be like moving around, like army man crawling, army man crawl, and and I'd have little things hanging from the the bottom of the bed. And I totally did that too, dude. I loved it. Yeah. So I was actually, I thought underneath the bed was like a cool little like fort area of yep, mine, yep. if anything. So I wasn't that afraid of it. At times, again, at night, you'd hear something and there were moments where I'd be like, uh-oh, there's a snake underneath there. Yeah, or, or Pennywise. <laughs> well, Jawheads, if you haven't guessed it, we are reviewing The Boogeyman this week. It is the latest movie being adapted from one of the many, many Stephen King short stories out there. Yeah, 100,000. I think I read... This is his 11th film uh, since 2017. His 11th adaptation since 2017. Right. I'm going to talk about that. It's okay. absolutely insane. I mean, it, it seems like it ramped up big time. Is um, that where I read it in your yeah, review? I think you did. I shared <laughs> my review and Matt's like, I read it somewhere. Yeah, you read it from my review. Well, I well with done you. on that research, Ryan. <laughs> um, Spoiler alert. It, it is amazing, though. I think w- the success of it, especially, it seems right. to like have gotten everybody involved in like, yes, Stephen King sells it makes money that's i mean but dude we're going all the way back to the 70s right with stephen king adaptations being massive hits and there have been some failures for sure but like some of the best movies of all time are stephen king adaptations there there are but it, it's amazing like when i looked at all of them uh online you, there's a, a wikipedia page just dedicated to the adaptations of stephen king's it, it's more or less like one a year, one every like three years. For the longest time, they, they pop up, they pop up, and then all of a sudden, Bang. it is just like a ton of Stephen King adaptations out there. That's weird. I wonder why. I mean, he has been such a prolific writer, you know? So, I don't know. Well, Jawheads, get thinking of your favorite scenes from these Stephen King movies. I got five picked out that I think are going to be uh, kind of thrilling. As do I. We are also going to play some movie trivia this week. In honor of The Boogeyman, we are playing... Horror movie kids trivia. So I should be good at that. Think of kids that are in horror films. Okay, I should be good at that. This is a Stump the Kabinsky, right? This is Stump the Kabinsky. No guess this week. We have five questions to Stump the Kabinsky. All right. That sound good? That sounds great. All right. I'm, I'm stoked for this, uh, this category. I am too. It's also our last week celebrating Jane Fonda. Uh, we still have not heard anything from Ethel from Bethlehem Woods Retirement Center. We're hoping for the best, but I know there's still some fans of Jane Fonda out there. So let's start with a Jane Fonda fact. Yes, yes. Uh, <clears throat> so they say age comes with wisdom, and Jane Fonda, at 85 years old, uh, has a lot of wisdom. And you may be wondering, okay, I at least wonder, how can I pick Jane Fonda's brain? How can I share some of her wisdom? Well, good news. Uh, Julia Louis dreyfus launched her podcast in April called Wiser Than Me. And who do you boys think was her inaugural guest? I'm going to say Jane Fonda. It was. Good you, guess, right? That's oh, like, man. I don't know where you came up with that. That's really good. Matt, you're stumped this week because... Uh. 
Ride the movie guy just stumped you. Uh, he was on it way faster than you were. Jane Fonda herself was. Uh, so yeah, there, there's wisdom out there of Jane Fonda right now on Julia Louise Dreyfus's podcast. Wiser than me. I just got to ask Matt. You usually book the guests here on Cinema Jaw. Why is Julia Louis Dreyfus getting Jane Fonda, and we're not getting Jane, and we're celebrating her all month? We should get Julia. That yes. would that'd be pretty sweet too. Uh, I'll, I'll work get on, on that. I'll Will you get on, on that, Matt? Yeah. I'm on it. We can let both of them know we're really stupid. So <laughs> that, that should... They'd both be wiser than me. <laughs> I think collectively, any one of the two of them, it doesn't matter which, would be wiser than the collective, all three of us. And they could so. probably beat us all up also. So they're mm-hmm. stronger mm-hmm. and smarter mm-hmm. than it's, us. I caught this on NPR. It sounds like a cool podcast. I'm going to I'm gonna check it out. Good for Julia. It I is. think Cinema Jaw Versus is like a cool podcast too, where the three of us have to try and beat up an 85-year-old and watch us all get... <laughs> watch us all just get really bricked how embarrassing there, <laughs> there is that great video we took of uh me and you wrestling in the ring oh yeah that's a great one i, I don't know if that's still out somewhere on oh, yeah, instagram or I, somewhere i have it i clotheslined matt in a wrestling ring and i took him down that looked good didn't oh, it? oh fantastic your, your wife shot the video i remember i, thinking, I really this, committed <laughs> I remember thinking this is never going to come out and the video is fantastic i just i remember <laughs> thinking to myself I, I have to make sure my legs go over my head so when you <laughs> When you when you clotheslined me, I really kicked my legs out and fell backwards on my back, and I didn't know what to expect. Uh, the the mat is harder than you think. It's well, not a trampoline. The thing I remember is you hit the mat so hard, and we were not supposed to be in the no. ring. So after Matt hit the ring hard, some guy turned around. He's like, "Get out of the get ring!" Out of there. I was like, "I didn't get to clothesline Ryan. Come on." That was awesome. That, that was, was that was fun times. We'll put that up. I, I post it on Instagram every once in a while. Yeah, get it up for for fresh for the job. I will. Good stuff. All right, let's get on to this review of The Boogeyman, Matt. As you mentioned, Stephen King adaptations have been a thing since 1976. That's the year Brian De Palma adopted Carrie for the big screen. In recent years, the adaptations have been a plenty, many of them from some of King's lesser known works. Since 2017, Matt spoiled this, there have been 10 movies released on Stephen King books or short stories. The Boogeyman marks the 11th. Over the last six decades, there have been plenty of hits, but also plenty of misses. Is The Boogeyman a hit, or should have it stayed in the bedroom closet? Matt Kay and I turned out the lights to find out. It's all just in your head. There's no such thing as monsters. You need to grow up! I'm serious, Sawyer. I need to be alone! The Boogeyman centers on high school student Sadie Harper and her younger sister Sawyer. They're still reeling from the recent death of their mother. Their father is dealing with his own intense pain from the loss. Enter the Boogeyman. Matt The Boogeyman was published in 1978. That's a long time ago. And it was just a short story by Stephen King. I want to start this discussion by asking you, was there enough material here for a feature-length movie? No, probably not. I I think, so I read the short story, uh, like before we went to see the movie. It's just a creepypasta. It's it's very- A a what? A creepypasta. (laughs) Okay. so uh, I don't know a creepy pasta. A creepy pasta is a horror story. I know this guy. <laughs> I don't know a creepy pasta. Do you Sorry. know the prerequisite of copy pasta? Wait. I mean, there's a lot of we got it. I know we're I know. asking you to understand level five here. I, I mean, I can't believe it. We're, I know. I know. He's Pene. not that much older than me. I know. Penne. Uh, yeah, it's okay. not penne. It's 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 not pasta in that sense. Okay. So so it's a short, self-contained horror story. Where uh, it, it usually has kind of like a like an O Henryish twist that's macabre and and um, vicious mm-hmm. a lot of the times. Slender Man came out of the the creepy pasta genre. 
And yeah, it's basically the the story of the boogeyman in Stephen King. A sick man goes to the short story. A sick man goes to a therapist, tells him about all this stuff. The sick guy leaves, and then the therapist finds himself haunted by the thing that the guy was telling him about. The end. I mean, that, it's it's really short. That's that's the whole thing. Like I think his daughter screams upstairs at the end of the the story. So he leaves a lot of doors closed and unopened. And I think that's the point. They took liberties to try to make it a deeper story, but that's the whole point of the the short story is that it's left to your imagination. Like, did he murder his children or did he not? Right. Was this, he this truly is the haunted? Guy, this is the guy that went to see the therapist. Right. Right. But but completely different in the movie. It's actually completely focusing different. on the therapist and his daughters. Right. Right. So which is cool. I like the liberties. To a degree, but I, I would have liked it maybe to center a little bit more on the guy who, who comes to see the therapist. Lester Billings is the character's Lester name. Lester Billings. I would have liked to maybe get a good flashback. Sure. Or, or maybe we find out his story, you know? I agree. So I, I looked up a little bit on Wikipedia what the, the short story was before we, we hit record here, and I was shocked that it, it really does focus more on Lester Billings it's it's a couple paragraphs, yeah. It's, yeah, it's very on short. That. And then it's like, oh, okay, so this is what it's about. And yet uh, the movie really focuses on the therapist and his daughters, almost like the, the screenwriters picked up like where the Boogeyman story would have went after what Stephen King had, had written. It's almost to that, that degree. I guess, right. So it's fair to say that what we get on screen has nothing to do with what Stephen King put on the page. Yeah. I actually have a quote. I got a quote. Oh, you do? I do. Here's the thing. Stephen King has written one nonfiction book, dude. Have you ever read it? The Dance Macabre. I have not. All right. He, if you're interested in horror at all or how to write horror, it's a great book. But even if you don't want to learn how to do horror, just to understand the mind of King. And he has this quote. The audience holds its breath along with the protagonist as she, he, more often she, approaches that door. The protagonist throws it open, and then there's a 10-foot-tall bug. The audience screams, but this particular scream has an oddly relieved sound to it. A bug 10 feet tall is pretty horrible, the audience thinks, but I can deal with a 10-foot-tall bug. I was afraid that it might be 100 foot tall. Right. If you show the monster, if you open the door, you lose something. 100%. So I think they lose something in this. Yes, because... The the thing is, is probably, again, not having read the, the boogeyman story, we're not seeing the actual boogeyman. We're in the movie. We're actually seeing the creature. Right. Right. So. so, And that's what it becomes a monster movie. And it becomes a monster movie. And then that gets us into, and we'll, we'll discuss this a little bit later. Is the monster real? Is it in the heads of the characters? Oh, I don't think they leave any room for interpretation. It's real. I, I believe they did also. But I, I think that's part part of the problem I had with the movie is I was going in watching probably 70% of the movie thinking, okay, well, this is still probably going to end up being just in the characters' heads until it couldn't be anymore. And then I was like, what? Is it just a monster movie? And that was a letdown for me. Letdown for me too. It was? Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love a good monster movie, especially by Stephen King. Yeah, but this wasn't like a great monster movie by any means. No. I mean, you, if you're going to make a monster movie, you got to make a damn good monster movie. The, the creature was not scary. Not at all. I didn't think so. Like, yeah, with spindly limbs and kind of lurking in the shadows. Like, there's nothing special about this creature. Like, I know we bring this up probably way too much, but the Babadook... That's a special monster. I mean, mm -hmm. that's brand new, and they leave a lot of room to for that character to be in the minds of the... Right. Uh, it could be interpreted in a certain way, right? I exactly. There's enough ambiguity to make it interesting. Here, it's just straightforward. I agree, and I thought 100% the Babadook's a great example. That's what I thought we were going to get. And right. I'm talking like 60%, right. 70% of this movie, I'm still thinking like, okay, it's really going to twist here so that we understand that we it leaves us guessing was this in the character's mind or was it a straight up monster movie and you're right it's, it's just spilled out on you know it's a monster movie. it's a pg-13 thing and it's probably fine well that brings me to my next point and a question i had for you was this is directed by 
uh, Rob Savage. And I was wondering, did he ramp up this, the, the scares, the horror enough for you? Was the anticipation horror sure. there for you? Yes. That, okay, I'm glad you called it that, anticipation horror. I have it written down as creepy dread. Um, no pasta involved in this No, one. No pasta. Um, yes, I love that and, and hate that at the same time, where, where, where a director will, will build up the tension and then release it. Even though I know it's coming, it still gets me every time. Even when the scares happen on the beat, we were taking the escalator out of the movie theater, and you mentioned too many of the scares were on the beat, and I agree with you. But th- those, for me, are still very effective. This is a straightforward horror movie, and it doesn't suck. Like It's effective in the horror. I was scared. So I, I, it had some decent jump scares. However, my complaint is it was too... like. It followed the the normal horror beats, too. Yes, too tonally. So it didn't take any risks. A hundred percent. If if you see like a James Wan, I, I think he's been the sort of the the recent master at uh, scaring us, where it's just off the normal beat that you're right. going to get. Right, it subverts your expectations. Right. If, if say we're playing the drums here, it's like boom, 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 scare. Boom, 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 scare. That's what this one's doing. And okay, you're getting part of the rhythm. James Wan throws that like boom, boom, scare, 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 boom. You know what I mean? It throws right. you off. Yes. And that's a when- A staccato rhythm. Right. Us, all yeah. of a sudden, as, as a movie goer, you're sitting in a theater and you don't know when the next scare is going to come from. And that's thrilling with the James Wan movies. My complaint here is I think Rob just kept it too much to the beat. Once you got sort of the rhythm of this movie, I was already getting to be- a Halfway little bored. through, I was like, oh, this is really not that scary. I mean, okay, I knew something was going to jump out here, so on and so forth. I still get creeped out by that. I don't know why. Maybe that's just me. And now, am I the only one in the room here that thinks that the therapist that the kids go to see, uh, she has those uh, round glasses, and she's telling, uh, she's trying to get the, the youngest child, uh, Sawyer, to be not afraid of the dark, and... I thought the therapist was scary as hell with those glasses and the way they litter uh, in that scene where the red light would constantly go off. That was a little weird. That was really creepy. And then there's a scene with her at the end that was yes. creepy too. So you were a little bit creeped out by the oh, therapist. Oh, for sure. I, I think you're meant to be. Okay. I, I wasn't sure if you're meant to be or I just thought like, man, they- We they, see the creature in that scene. That's they, right in the trailer. You do. You do. But in the trailer, I thought maybe the therapist- turns into the the creature like in the child's mind again i thought this was going to be you know more more cerebral cere- yeah than, than it was not, not so much no not so much but <clears throat> the therapist did actually freak me out this is monsters inc for adults like any <laughs> any anywhere there's a closet this creature can can jump out so i'm talking about sawyer uh who is played by vivian lyra blair and then sophie thatcher uh plays the older uh child what did you think of their performances? Nothing to knock. I think they're both great. Vivian Blair is the little girl who played Leia in Obi-Wan Kenobi. Oh, she is. Did she seem familiar? She did. I I did not put that together. Interesting. Yeah. I you know what? This this came out in the research today and I'm like, "Okay, I didn't notice while I was watching the film either just that she seemed very familiar." She's great. She's just such a precocious little girl. I don't know. I like I loved her. And, and I thought she did a fantastic job. And even the friend of Sadie, played by Madison Hu, uh, stood out for me a little bit. She, mm-hmm. she has a very small role, but I loved her. But boy, did I hate the other uh, girls that she You're was supposed to. Yeah, but it, it, remember when... She was, um, she was like Nancy from <laughs> Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. <laughs> But but remember when uh, Daniel LaRusso goes to... Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> we're talking Karate Kid for one second. Remember when... You, when are we not? <laughs> when Daniel LaRusso goes to the uh, fancy party to meet Allie, and then uh, the, the waiter spills the spaghetti on Daniel LaRusso, and then the entire party laughs at him. We look back at this moment. It's just so silly. Like... Somebody, we're talking like grown adults are looking at a teenage kid and just laughing their heads off at him. I think that happened back then. He has spaghetti sauce on him. There is a scene just like this in The Boogeyman in the opening moments where they uh, squish a, la- a lunch on uh, the girl. Yeah, and it that goes was sad. on her dress. It was sad, but I think we've matured. As, as a species where we're not laughing the way they would, but this was like a throwback to the 1980s movies where the girls are like, oh, 
She got her lunch on her. <laughs> like, come on. That was it was so a little cheesy. clumsy. It was a little clumsy. Very clumsy. Very clumsy. What about the rest of the cast here? Uh, I, the, the rest of the cast sucks. Uh, I, I didn't like the dad. I didn't like the doctor. Um, I mean, do we count the creature? I don't. I guess that's not cast. The, the dad was like wooden, and the, the doctor totally wooden. I, I, I didn't like any of the rest and, of the cast. And the you? other, no, I didn't either. I thought the dad was, was sufficient, um, but not a, a great like horror dad in any sense. He needed to be more involved in the, in the kids' lives, I think. But the other character we haven't oh, mentioned yes, here. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, is this character of Lester's Rita. Lester's wife. Yes. So Rita is Lester's wife, and we're introduced to her. We're, I wasn't even sure she was still al- alive at, at the moment when they go to this house. Terrible scene. I'm glad you, you're you're on the same page here. So she ends up living in this rundown house. Are we are we doing spoilers here? I mean, yeah, I mean, we can just mention that it's a rundown house, and I, I had such a problem with this because number one, they're in basically a, a nice suburb, and right. It it seems that they go to this house that's also in the in the neighborhood, and it is completely ransacked. There is no way a house would look like that in a n- normal neighborhood that the neighbors would just let this go. I mean, there's graffitis on the wall. The, the pool's got stuff swimming in it, knocked over. And that not only that, Rita, the character, ends up still living in this rundown right, house. Casually how, blowing shotgun blasts around How the ridiculous house. was this plot line? Very ridiculous. Stupid. Stupid on so many, so many levels. I, I won't even get into the fire hazards. I know. <laughs> I mean, when when Sadie first walks upstairs, I'll, I don't want to spoil anything. I'm just going to say that that something's there. That it, At that point, I'm like, okay, throw all believability out the window. And then we come to find out that thing that was there was left by a human. So I kind of had to backtrack my thought on that. But then I was like, no, that's stupid. That, that, I mean, that this would have caused a fire long ago. Then she's just blowing casual shotgun blasts around the house. Nobody's calling the cops. And and at some point we get a trap. I don't want to... It's a trap for the boogeyman, but I don't want to spoil anything. And the trap wouldn't be lethal. It wouldn't hurt a fly. You, <laughs> you, you, you can't just... You can't just, like, hit a bullet with a hammer. Right. <laughs> like, that's not how that stuff works. It, it, was, it was dumb. I'm glad you're on the same page. I thought that's where... Uh, I wasn't a fan of the movie at that point. I was already like teetering. I looked at my watch, and it, it was only like 45 minutes in. It felt like we had been watching the, the movie for well over an hour. I was like, oh, man. And then all of a sudden, this Rita character pops up, and it was so ridiculous that that's when I, I started to think, all right, this movie's just not going to work for me. This is when I, I could feel it was See, a thumbs okay, down. This is where it could have pivoted. And, and become a true 80s movie. And we could have got like a montage of Sawyer and Sadie, or Sawyer, yeah, Sawyer and Sadie like gearing up, doing like an action montage where they're like tying the headband <laughs> oh, around the, and like sharpening the end of a tennis racket and creating like, like Home Alone style death traps for the boogeyman. <laughs> that would have been cool. Like I would have been fully on board for that. Oh, I love it. I love it. That is good stuff. Yeah, that would have been a good movie. That's not the movie we got. It, it just didn't happen. Unfortunately, it didn't happen at all. It kind of half-assed happened. Um, let's talk some jaw-dropping moments. Was there a moment in here that we haven't discussed that you did want to highlight? I mean, the, the, the candles in particular, uh, such a dumb scene. But we talked about that. Why don't you go first? I'll see if I can come up with another one. Okay, I do have one. And I think it's uh, the only part that actually got me to look away from the screen. And I've talked about it before. I, I hate... Um, people throwing up and or stuff getting pulled out of people's throats. and Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, th- th- there's a good one. There's a good movie. one in this movie where something is getting pulled out of uh, one of the characters' throats. However, it made no sense, rhyme or reason, on why that particular object is getting pulled out of her throat. Um, yeah, like suddenly the boogeyman has weird powers. To, like it, it makes no sense. It, zero. Right. I was like, was yeah. that a hallucination? Is right. It, yeah. I, I, or was it? You're right. Did the boogeyman put it there? And then if he does have that power, why isn't he doing this? Yeah. Why not just put some poison in there? Kill all the, the victim. Time. And, yeah. Right. So I, if you think about it, it, didn't make much sense. But the actual uh, scene and on screen got me to look away. I actually closed my eyes a little bit and looked off screen. Uh, okay. 
there's there's a scene I can't I have to dance around spoilers where the boogeyman is on top of uh, there's a confrontation I'll just say another character and uh, we see the creature in all its glory now I'm not gonna say this was a true jaw dropping scene because I don't think the creature design was great but man it's always fun to see a cool creature attack that was fun what was the 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 branches or what would you call it the stuff that the boogeyman another thing they really left that hanging out there didn't they yeah mold. I don't I mean, know. Like, there, there, this is something that would be on the wall, the ceilings, and you would know that the boogeyman sort of like lives there right. or has been there. Yes. So I guess I, this is my interpretation. Like when a creature of that nature comes through, it's almost like like a like a lesser uh, sort of cosmic, like like a Lovecraftian type creature. His corruption, his his evil spreads throughout his environment. <laughs> And you start to see it on the walls and ceilings as like tendrils of the evil reaching out through our world, you know? And eventually, and this is in um, the the Stranger Things. I was just going to say Stranger Things. And sure. this, this reminded me a little bit like they were trying to go oh, for that, right? they went for it hardcore. In fact, I believe they evoke Stranger Things in the marketing material for this movie. Oh, jeez. So I, I, somebody who was involved, one of the producers, or, or maybe it was Savage, is involved with Stranger Things. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so there you go. I mean, yes, that's that's what they were going for with the with the mold or whatever you want to call it. Again, no explanation on it. So, I, it's tough to say that if it worked for me or not. I was just confused by it. I think, if anything, yeah, yeah, it's dumb, yeah. just dumb. <laughs> Movie poster quote here, Matt. I went with, I was more frightened during Boogie Nights than Boogeyman. <laughs> Uh, I, I similar. I went with the boogeyman moniker deserves a better movie. One and a half jaws for ride the movie guy. I'm being generous and I'm giving it, I'm dusting off the quarter jaw. I'm giving it 1.75 blasphemy. No, this is, this does not deserve a quarter jaw. If you're looking for a summer thrill, you know, PG 13, go ahead and bring your teenagers to this movie it's perfectly appropriate with, with a few minor, like a, a bit of drug use, a couple of language. There's no gore in this. It's a family horror movie. <laughs> like you can handle this. I, I would say it's in the same vein. Nowhere near as good, but in the same vein as a poltergeist. Oh, fuck. Reel it back, Matt. No, really quick. In the I'm same giving vein you a second. Terms, to, no, I'm giving a second. Reel, in the terms it, of no, its no, no, no. scare reel level. It it's, it's it's nowhere, nowhere near, near no. It's not even on the scare level. You're you're starting to make an ass out of yourself. I Leave it at one point seven five. One point seven five. It's scary enough. Let There's, bygones be bygones. It's a PG thirteen horror movie. If you're if you're a fan of that kind of thing, I don't think you're going to be terribly disappointed. I, I think it's slow jawheads. I think wait for a rental. Uh, don't waste your money in the theater. And I did read I did read this article online that this was actually intended for Hulu. Um, yes, I read that too. Okay, so it was intended to be a, a direct right. uh, streamer on Hulu. They streamed it for test audiences that really liked it a lot. The directors then screened it for Stephen King. Right. Stephen Who also King liked it. Liked it a lot also, and wrote a note to the director in the studio saying they would be damn fools to just put this on a streaming service. He just wants his name in the paper. <laughs> and somehow Stephen King's, he's got this weight about him. They're like, well, you know, Stephen King liked it. I, we, let's not just put it right on Hulu. Let's, let's release this in the theaters. I think this is a streaming movie all the way, 100%. If this was on Hulu, I probably wouldn't have been so hard on it. But again, if you're going to get me to go out to the theater, spend my money and go to the theater... Don't go see it, Josh. Uh, see, don't go I think see it. I think it's going to do just fine. Listen, if you go in with low expectations, expecting like haunted house type scares, you're going to have fun. It was fine. Goofy. You're giving it one point seven five. One point seven five. Stay it's, with that, Matt. No, no, no. That's no. where I'm staying. You're, you're getting a little. I'm not saying it's a, a total crazy. piece of crap. It's not a total piece of crap. All right. One and a half jaws for me. One point seven five from Matt. Wait for streaming. That's My all expectations I'm were a little high. <laughs> Well, you're a big Stephen King fan, and that's what makes this next list so fun, it right? Does, it does. Um, Matt came up with this top five. He said, let's do Stephen King scenes. I mean, we've talked Stephen King. We've celebrated him on Jaw, but we've never talked about specific scenes. 
And we love to do that every once in a while. And he's had some classic films. Oh, man. Yeah. So this should be entertaining. What do you got sitting at number five, buddy? Well, so I decided to come at this from a bit of a different angle. Oh, boy. So, I so, hate when you do this no, shit. No, no. It's nothing crazy. Like, for the most part, like, I chose movies that you would expect to be on this list. But I tried to choose an alternative scene. Like, at number five, I have a scene from Carrie. But it's not the prom scene. Are and, you kidding me? Right. That would be the scene that we all would choose. And it is There's a lot of blood in that scene. It's a great scene. <laughs> it's a great scene. But I went with uh, another scene with blood, the plug it up scene. Sissy Spacek, who plays Carrie, who is this ingenue who gets her period for the first time while in the showers at school. And she's totally ostracized by her peers and doesn't understand because her mom is this uh, Christian fundamentalist who's never told her about her body, what's going on. And she's scared. She's bleeding. So she goes to her friends for help. She clearly never read, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Clearly, <laughs> clearly. So she goes, she turns to her friends, mostly in horror. I don't think she's like, hey, what's going on? She's just kind of like holding up her hands in the shower scene. And her friends, these cruel teenage girls led by PJ Souls, who, are, who will for, forever be one of my favorite actresses, rock and roll high school forever, they start throwing tampons at her saying, plug it up, plug it up. And they get a chant going until the gym teacher comes in and, and puts an end to the cruelty. But she's laying on the floor of the shower and you see her blood going down the drain, almost, oh. almost like, a, um, like a psycho uh, shot. And it's... it's uh, it's a pretty startling scene. You get to see the the abuse that this poor girl goes through on a daily basis, mm. uh, and it establishes the character of Carrie as a sympathetic villain. So I like it. Good one. Uh, I thought for sure it would be the prom scene. So I, I like where you're going with this, Matt. I had took tackled my list, trying to just come up with some under the radar picks. Oh, okay. And then adding a couple of classics that I just want to talk about because I love the scenes in the hey, movies. That's why we're here, man. Right. But at number five is one of my under the radar picks. I think I talked about this movie, uh, quite possibly on, uh, embarrassing nudity moments in, uh, in our lives when you're watching at the wrong age with your folks, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you pretend to cover your eyes. Right. One yeah. of these moments. Right. So this happened, uh, in creep show two, the follow up to the, popular creep show movie came yeah. out in 1987 and creep show is a, a series of vignettes and the one that i'm talking about is the raft oh god i love that one and the raft i what i was reading about today is the raft was actually written by stephen king for the movie the rest of creep show too was based on short stories he had already written but this was like an original for the movie and the raft is such a simple concept it, it's four teenagers uh, like college age, high school age, are swim out to a raft in the middle of a lake uh, to have some fun. And one of the guys sees this like black oil uh, type of substance on yeah, the water. Some kind of creature. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, that, that thing's moving. And they all laugh at him. Well, sure enough, it's this like floating, what almost looks like an oil spill kind of in, in a sense that goes after the, the kids. And it eventually is this like weird creature that some kind of algae or slime. Yeah, starts yeah. to eventually pick off the kids. And that's that's the entire vignette. So the ending scene of this movie comes down to, there's four to start, two have been uh, perished by this uh, monster. We're down to two. It's a guy and a girl. They're on the raft, and uh, the girl's sleeping. And I remember watching this with my parents, and I, I was like, oh, my God. I was like so into it. I was like on the edge of my seat, almost like leaning to the television screen. And I'm like... This is what he's going to do. You know, he's going to make a swim for it. I was like totally into it. And he ends up like lifting up the girl's shirt. And like her boobs are, you know, there and they end oh, up. Oh, what a creep. Oh, yeah. They, she ends up waking up and they kiss and blah, blah, blah. Anyways, the ending scene. She kisses scenes, him after that? Yeah. Anyways, the, the ending scene sees uh, her hair like getting caught and, and she's going to get pulled in by the monster. He more or less pushes her in and then makes a swim for the uh, shore. Oh, what a D-bag. And I don't want to tell you what happens to him, but I remember it just being so intense at the end. If this kid's going to make it, is at least one of them going to survive? Very excited. I love that movie. It's been... 20 years since I've seen it. Yeah, both the creep show movies are good. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. They are. All right. At number four, I went with a scene from Stand By Me. 
Oh, of course, the throw up scene, of course, right? Yeah. The oh, throw up I scene. nailed it. All right. You did, but I thought that was a bit of an alternative no, scene. Oh, that's not alternative. That's top tier stand by me. Oh, no. I mean, like the the train scene, the the confrontation with the with Kiefer Sutherland right. at the end. I would say the train scene probably one ups the throw up scene, but I mean, I'm a huge fan of, yeah. uh, you know, lard ass. Yeah. Yeah. Even though I hate throwing up, but this is this in a is comic a, way. This is a barf of Rama, <laughs> dude. Uh, this is where you, I guess you really get to understand the character of Gordy and what he brings to the table in this group of misfit friends. You know, uh, I can't remember Corey Feldman's character's name. God damn it. Can we throw it in the fish tank? Phil, I can't remember his name. I want to say it was like Harvey or something. Like that. I, uh, that's probably way off. But anyway, and River Phoenix, he's the hero. Um, Corey Feldman is like the soldier and, uh, Jerry O'Connell is like the, the the fat kid. And Gordy is the storyteller. And they're all sitting around the campfire on this adventure. And they're like, tell us a story, Gordy. And he tells the story of lard ass and the pie eating, eating contest. And you get to first understand Gordy's talent. Will Wheaton is amazing. Uh, even though he's not the main actor in the scene, he's just kind of setting up the story. But you believe his character can tell the story. You know, I love Will Wheaton. I think he's underappreciated. He is. So, there you go. My number four. He narrates, Rama. narrates some audio books, which are very good. He's great. He and is. I like saying Will Wheaton. Will Wheaton. My number four, I'm going to a movie that I just watched for Kathy Bates' month, Dolores Claiborne. Oh, wow. Yes, yes. And the scene that I picked for Dolores Claiborne is the opening scene of the movie. And I'm going to spoil it because it is the opening scene. So it's, it's not a major spoiler here. But the film opens with Kathy Bates throwing a woman down a flight of stairs. We see a struggle at the top of the stairs. And Kathy Bates uh, throws her down the steps. and Seemingly. Right. And the lady comes down all the way, and it's a it's an ugly fall. It's a I mean, brutal fall. It's a really brutal fall. And she's fall. an elderly person. Yes. But it doesn't kill her. So now she's at the bottom of the steps in absolute pain and not dead. So what does Kathy Bates do? She goes to the kitchen to find something heavy and blunt, and she comes back in to finish the well, job. She, she does consider the knives <laughs> and ultimately grabs a marble rolling pin. <laughs> She holds this thing up over her head. And I mean, this is scary Kathy Bates, right? This yeah, is, this is po- like right around the misery time. Right. This is when Kathy Bates just has his presence on screen. You're like, oh my God. And she puts this rowing pin over her head and she's going to strike this old lady. And right around the same time, someone's coming in the front door. Now, this isn't that big of a spoiler, Jawheads, because this is how the film opens. It's the first two minutes. Right. And then from there, the story opens up. So... I'm highly recommending Dolores Claiborne, but that opening scene, talk about a, a, a moment to draw you into the movie. I didn't know what the film was about. And after that two minutes, I was like, oh yeah, I'm totally in, totally in. Yeah, that's an underappreciated movie. Sure is. Yeah, no doubt. Good one, Rye. All right, so I went with Shawshank at number three. Uh-oh. Crazy, right? Uh-oh. It's, only, on, it's only, on my list also. I hope you don't take my scene. Only at number three. I wanted to choose something different, so okay. this is not... Andy. Okay, hey, 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 don't. All right, okay. okay. Not not the usual suspects, at least I hope. So I went with the scene, which is, I think, such a great scene. I actually watch this every once in a while, uh, which is weird. Brooks was here. Do you know what I'm talking oh, about? Oh, yeah. Okay, so Brooks gets released. Brooks is the old, the elder statesman in Andy Dufresne's kind of gang of friends. He gets released from prison. He's got to be in his late 80s. He sets his pet bird free. He was like a bird man from Alcatraz type. And then uh, he, he crosses the threshold of the prison outdoors. He shakes hands with the guards. You see him on a bus and he looks so frightened. He's this little old man. And then the rest of the scene is narrated from Brooks's point of view as he's writing a letter to his friends back at Shawshank Prison. And he tells him about his job. And he tells him about the halfway house he's living at. How the world is moving so fast. All of that stuff. And you come to realize as the scene progresses that you're, you're watching, you're hearing him narrate his suicide note. And then you see the character of Brooks get up and uh, carve with this little pocket knife into the ceiling or, or this little panel. Uh, uh, Brooks was here. And then proceeds to dangle from a rope. It's a sad ending for a great character, but 
he looked so happy before he did that. Like he made his choice. He made his peace with his choices. Like in, in the narration, he's like, I've decided not to stay. And that's how he ends his letter. Mm. And then Red, the character played by Morgan Freeman, says he should have died in here. Fucking great, man. Really Fucking is. great. Really that is. is. Amazing. Love that scene. It, it, you just describing it got me choked up here, Matt. It's an amazing scene. It is. I like Brooks. I love Red. I will talk more Shawshank. Okay. I promise you. Right. I promise you. Uh, my number three pick is a lesser known Stephen King story. A lot of people might not know it is. If I told people that Tom Hanks was in a Stephen King movie, it doesn't no, jump no, out no. at you right away. I mean, you know. You course. know because you're a Stephen King. Of course. But a lot of people out there wouldn't know that 1999, The Green Mile uh, yeah. was released and starred Tom Hanks. And it also starred Michael Clark Duncan, who has uh, since passed away, unfortunately, at such a young age. But he played John Coffey, who was accused of murder, um, a murder that he didn't commit. He was a convicted murder. And he was convicted. And it turned out that John Coffey, this character, had special healing powers. The guards, one of them being Tom Hanks, learns of his powers, but there's nothing that the guards can do to overturn uh, the conviction. And so John Coffey is going to be executed. My pick for the scene is the ending of The Green Mile. Don't I mean, put me it, in the dark, boss. It is so, so sad. The other thing is that John Coffey doesn't like the dark, so he doesn't want to have the mask over his head yeah. and asks that he gets electrocuted in the chair um, with no mask and he can see everybody. And, and here, the bond. I mean, the only thing I have against The Green Mile is that it's just too damn long of a movie. It's something like, throw it in the fish tank. I'm dying to know how long The Green Mile is. I know it's over three, three hours. It is. It has no business being over no, it two doesn't. hours. It, doesn't. it should be like two hours. I'll give you 215. I don't know what it's doing well, at three hours long, but he, it's over three hours, I guarantee you. Here's the thing. I don't, I don't, obviously Shawshank wasn't a big hit at the box office, but I think by the time the Green Mile came out, it had already gotten that buzz as this is a special movie. So like we got Stephen King, we got a prison story, and we got Tom Hanks. This is a three hour movie. (laughs) This is going to be the next Shawshank. So so I would watch it more often, but I was going to say you do get the connection of these guards hanging out with John Coffey. They understand Mr. Bojangles, uh, how special he is. Mr. Bojangles, the mouse. You got all this, these great scenes. And then this ending scene, the one that I'm highlighting here, is the execution of John Coffey uh, with you know no mask on. So we see just how terrifying this is. I mean, it's a, it's a gruesome scene, a sad scene. When Tom Hanks cries, we all cry. Amen. We're going to take a break here, Ryan? Why don't we do that? Let's save our number two and our number one for after the break. Plus, we're going to play some trivia. Stick with us, Jawheads. We close out Jane Fonda Month with a real banger. In fact, it's a slap in the face. In 2005, she starred alongside the great Jennifer Lopez in Monster-in-Law. What is that? What? Where's your bridesmaid's dress? Oh, I gave it to Ruby's daughter. She works at Hooters. She was thrilled. I don't have a daughter. (laughs) Take off that white dress right now, or I'll take it off for you. Don't you tell me what to do. You did not just poke me. Don't you touch me, you two-bed tramp. Oh! Oh my God, Viola, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to. You don't go and slap somebody and then apologize. Get some backbone. This is crazy. And we are back on Cinema Jaw. Matt, we don't want to leave the jaw heads hanging. We were right in the middle of our Stephen King list. We did our one, our five through three. Yes, now it's time for our two heavy hitters. You ready with number two? I am. We do like to leave them hanging a little bit. That's called the cliffhanger. It know? is. So here, here's, the, here's the payoff, Ryan. I went with Misery at number two, but it is not the hobbling scene, which is absolutely an amazing, harrowing scene. I went with Paul Sheldon's Escape, so this is James Kahn's character's escape. He has planned, he's clear at this point that, that Annie Wilkes, Kathy Bates' character, is an absolute psychopath. She's beyond 
any kind of reason, his only chance for escape is to is to kill her, to overpower her. So he's like he he plays to her her psychosis and is like, well, we have to leave misery for the for the world. The misery is his character in this this series of novels that this guy's written. We have to leave her alive for the world. Give me till dawn to finish the book. And he does. He sits there at the typewriter writing all night long. She comes in to, to read the final manuscript only to find that he's holding it with doused in lighter fluid and the manuscript is on the floor. She had brought him his, his match and, and glass of Don Perignon, which she famously uh, mispronounces. And he lights the match, lights it all on fire, and she attacks. And then he is prepared he's in a wheelchair but he goes at it winds up crushing her with a, a typewriter but she's not quite dead as he's crawling out the room <laughs> yeah. he grabs the little pig statue and boom smashes her right in the face that is a great scene it's a great fight scene it's like a knockdown dragged out brawl uh there's blood flying all over the place it's brutal james Kahn hobbled versus kathy bates it's good yeah, stuff it is man i rewatched it today it's amazing my number two pick comes from a movie I, I I didn't even know anything about this story. So for me, I think this is a case where uh, the movie, not knowing the the book, it was it, to a huge advantage. I'm talking about 2007's The Mist. Yeah. Didn't know where this movie was going at all. I always remember thinking if I was in the movie The Mist, which for uh, over half the film sees a whole entire town basically trapped inside a, a grocery store, um, wondering what's out there in the mist. I always said if I was in that grocery store, this would have turned into a Seinfeld episode because I would have argued with the town folk that it's a fog. I don't know why they're calling it a mist. <laughs> And I know we would have went back and forth. I would have been arguing. It's a fog. Where, where do you see the mist? But okay. It's an East Coast thing, I guess. They call it a mist out there. I swear to God, it's a fog, but whatever. All right. So the my scene that I'm highlighting here. <laughs> I mean, they already had the movie The Fog. Jamie I, Lee Curtis was in it. That's why I thought the whole time, like, why are you guys not calling it a fog? <laughs> Come on. Who says the mist? A miasma? An, an entire town calls it the mist. Not one person says the fog. It's a fog. All right. Anyways. My, my scene here is the ending scene that sees a father, his son, and three adults escape from the, uh, the grocery store. They're in a car. You're talking about the final scene? Well, I don't even go the, in, the, the final moments of this movie are, are harrowing, right? <sighs> but even right before that, when we actually learn what is in the mist. The magnitude. Right. That is really the, the giant scene. creatures. That's the scene I'm highlighting here. All the way, really, they, I would when say... When they finally lose hope. Right. I would say when... when um, the, the, from that point all the way to the end would be... If I could cheat, I would say that would be the whole thing. But that moment when we actually see that there's these giant creatures came from another dimension and they're in the fog. I mean, the mist. Um, and when we see these creatures and he's driving... It's like the movie got so much bigger. The story got so much bigger. Um, my imagination, you know, ran wild. It really wowed me. I thought up until that, I thought it was a pretty good movie. Um, but it wasn't until... It was about a microcosm of society up until that point. Right, exactly. And then it changed gears and it was like, whoa. The whole world is screwed. A hundred percent. And it was like that, that scene was mind opening. I was like, wow, I, I actually really liked the movie The Mist. Even if too. even if it should be the fog, I, I like the mist. I like I like the mist too. Um, yeah, the last thirty minutes of this movie will will change your life. You know, it's 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 that messed up. How it the, is where this movie leaves you. What, was this a short story or was this? Uh, I've never actually read it. I think can we it's a novella. It? Can we just throw it in the fish tank? We'll throw one more in there, Phil. Would, if you can look that up, I don't know if this was a, a short story, a novella, or a. I do know this, that the ending of the novella is much different. And I think, even though it's it's very challenging, the ending of the movie is my preferred ending. Mm. It's really messed up how this movie ends. Have you ever seen it, Phil? I have. Yeah. It's... I'm in the opposite camp. I, I prefer the written ending personally. Oh, you've, you've read it also. Mm -hmm. All, right. All right. I watched this movie like a few months after Parker was born. Oof. And, oh my God, yeah. That's Tough when I one. learned, like... Oh, my taste in horror has changed. 
So, but yeah, I love that choice, dude. Is Into our number ones we go here, Matt. All right. Uh, at number one, I went with The Shining, which when you're talking about Stephen King adaptations, even though famously King is not a fan of this movie, he's absolutely wrong. It is a masterpiece of horror that will stand the test of time, not just of horror, but of filmmaking full stop. Just, it is great. So I could choose so many different scenes, but the one for some reason that creeps me out the most, aside from the the ones we all know so much, is that doesn't get talked about enough, is in the bathroom, where he is he goes in to pee after the bar scene. Jack you know, Nicholson. This Jack is. Nicholson, yeah, uh, as play, playing Jack Torrance, goes into the bathroom to to you know use the facilities, and it's this red and white bathroom. It's very strange. And the way Kubrick frames everything and shoots everything, it just makes you feel uneasy. And then there's a bathroom attendant, and he calls him Grady, the caretaker. He's like, I heard about you, man. You chopped up your wife and daughters. And That's a bad impression. Thanks. And Nicholson's <laughs> making these like funny faces, and like his tongue is waggling around in his teeth and stuff. And he's like, no, sir, I, I hate to differ with you, but you're the caretaker. You've always been the caretaker. And that tripped me out. That like <laughs> that line really blew the whole movie wide open for me. Like, he's always been the caretaker. What the hell is going on here? You know? And then like Kubrick switches the camera angle, so suddenly Jack is on the left, and then he switches it back, so Jack's on the right. He keeps doing these reverses to keep you on your toes. So it's it, it we it, the full trifecta. We have acting directing and cinematography in in a perfect perfect scene mm. and it doesn't get talked about enough I, I i mean that sounds fantastic your description makes me want to watch the shining again oh the shining is amazing i know you love it my number one i did go with the classic scene from stephen king and i wanted to go back in in my memory banks of when i actually first saw this movie this is 1994 the shawshank redemption okay and i was hoping you wouldn't spoil it you went with uh Brooks was here. I did go with Andy Dufresne's Escape. It it's, is it's classic. It is absolutely classic. It's it's one of the absolute great scenes in cinema history. If we were talking about, and I think we've even done maybe our favorite rain movies or rain scenes, um, it's it's one of the classic moments in rain. Uh, and and there's a ton that great moments that happen in the rain for dramatic effect. But this is by far top five material. Um, and what I remember the most is. I, I saw this before I was seeing so many movies and, and was, uh, you know, in a film critic group and doing a podcast where now I don't think the movie would have nearly fooled me as much and I would have been along for the ride. I saw this and I remember the, the scene vividly when the warden comes into Andy Dufresne's empty cell. He's in there uh, with Red and a couple of guards and he's like, where'd he go? He just disappeared like a fart in the wind. <laughs> this is a great line already. And then, and then he's like, and this, and this stupid poster and he picks up this rock and he throws it at the poster and it goes right through the poster. And you're like, what the hell? That is a moment. And when the shot that is absolutely incredible is when he rips the poster out and you see the hole in the wall and then Red, Morgan Freeman sort of puts his head into the frame like he's looking into the hole in the wall with all of the audience. We're like, holy crap. And from that point, they, they start to explain everything and we get this great quote from Morgan Freeman. Andy crawled to freedom through 500 yards of shit-smelling foulness I can't even imagine. Or maybe I just don't want to. 500 yards. That's the length of five football fields, just shy of a half a mile. And as he says that finishing line, Andy Dufresne comes out of the sewer pipe outside of Shawshank Prison in the pouring rain, rips his shirt open, the lightning's going, he looks up to the sky, the crane shot goes up, movie history. It's, it's incredible. It is incredible. I mean, that is, that is the money it's, shot. It's, it's literally like this, if you're going to make a great movie, this is how you do it, and you show that scene, you know? I, I recently read an article about Shawshank Redemption explaining why it is the greatest movie ever made. It tops Citizen Kane. It has, it has been at the top of IMDb's best movies for something like 12 years, 15 years, something like that. So 
It is largely considered the greatest movie of all time. It's it's a it's a doozy. Let's talk honorable mentions here, Matt. I got a few. I have a couple. Go ahead. Prom night, Carrie, uh, the ending of the mist, which you mentioned. Do you want a balloon, Georgie? Opening of it. Yeah, that's why I also I have mine. You're gonna you're gonna take all of mine, I believe. Uh, the hobbling scene from Misery. It's for the best. Uh, and dude, how do you not talk about here's Johnny? Like that is one of the best shining moments. You've, you've mentioned all of my honorable mentions there. My only other one you didn't talk about was from the cre- first Creep Show, the short film Something to Tide You Over. And I'm not sure I remember that one. It was where uh, uh, a rich dude thinks that his wife is cheating on him. She is cheating on him uh, with this other guy. And he captures that other guy and he puts him in the sand and he buries him in the sand so that only his head is above the sand and that the high tide is eventually just going to drown him. That's so creepy. So creepy. It's a good one. That is. That just happened to somebody in the news I heard about. What? Like, yeah, like up in Canada, if this poor guy fell through the like salt flats and got trapped and the tide came in and it was the end. Yeah. Scary stuff. It can happen. Yeah. Be careful out there. Jawheads, that was our list of our favorite scenes from Stephen King adaptations. I thought we did a pretty good job, but we always like to hear from the Jawheads. If we missed one of your favorites, shoot us a tweet at CinemaJaw or an email, feedback at CinemaJaw.com. I mean, we didn't, even, we didn't even talk about Sleepwalkers, right? I know. You know. There's still some that we missed out there. So, well, hey, Jawheads, if you got one out there, let us know. We did throw a few items into the fish tank. And before we play trivia, let's open up the fish tank. Let's say hi to Phil. And let's see what we missed. Let's open up that fish tank. Wait a moment. It's fish. Isn't it? DC, wake up, wake up. It's an old pad. It's a giant glass bowl. Hey, get some fish, folks. Who's coming with me besides Flipper? Here. That's a certain message. That means Luca Brasi sleeps with the fishes. You're going to need a bigger boat. Hello. Thank you so much for being, for letting me out this week. It's always good to be back. We love hearing about Stephen King. Uh, yeah. And I actually think we did a pretty good job. I think we covered the basis. And I actually think we did a, more importantly than hitting all the main ones, we also rightfully ignored the bad ones. Uh, and I think that's I something think that's understood. There are bad yes. Ones. Yes. Yeah. yes. Both pet cemeteries, which I love uh, dearly. Debatable. I love. <laughs> Dearly, have no place here. I agree. Uh, there's, some, there's some there's some good ones we missed too. Like we didn't talk about Cujo. We didn't talk about Christine. Christine is great. No. Maximum Overdrive. But there's some on Netflix that I've come across, like 1922 or In the Tall Grass, and I'm like, these are junk. I mean, they are like B movies at best. Running Man, Salem's Lot. Ooh, that's that's Running Salem's Man's pretty Lot good. is a much better book than. I agree. A Most movie. of them are better books. The the door and the I floor. Disagree. Was that King? I don't think so. The secret the, window was the secret window. Secret that's window what, probably what, what you're thinking about. of. Yes, yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, but we got we got a lot of Stephen in here. We have exclusively Stephen in our fish tank. Uh, what was Corey Feldman's character's name in Stand by Me? Good old Teddy. Teddy Do Champ. Yeah. I uh, said Harvey. I was close. Close. Very of the same they time ended period. In the last syllable. Yeah. Uh, how how long is the Green Mile? Ryan said over three hours. Matt, did you have a guess? No, uh, two and a half. Green Mile is 189 minutes, making it three hours and nine minutes. I uh, was right. I was right. I mean, it, it, I haven't seen that thing in so long. long. It is way too long. I know I own it on DVD, and I'm always like, who could watch this? I mean... Cut it down by like 30 minutes. <laughs> At least. I, you go 45 minutes chopped easily. Make that like a two and a half hour movie and, and I watch it a little bit more. Yeah. Great. Uh, then our last one in here, what was The Mist originally? A short story, a novella, a novel. And it's a novella. It's a novella. I, I honestly, I don't know. The difference? The diff- Yeah. Like I think sometimes literary people. About 150 I get pages. I get. Is that true? Something like that, twenty five. Wait, you're yeah. saying that's what how long the novella should be? No, no, a novella is less than hundred pages, I believe. I don't know if there's like an actual cutoff. Right. Or well, definition. and that's the thing. It seems like Ryan is Ryan is iconic outside of the show for when Matt and I get into arguments about music genre. <laughs> this is how I feel like book people. <laughs> right. We it's must a sound novella. Stupid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, it's a book. It's a novella. It's a treatise. it's a short story. <laughs> 
It's a treatment. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I don't know the exact, but I mean, I know of novellas when people call them. And it's like, okay, got it. That's a novella. But why it's a novella exactly? I'm not positive. I think parameters. It's, like, it's like a short novel. So like I said, around 100 pages or okay. so. so. That's my guess. Yeah. I really, I'm no expert. But there's no like cap on a novel. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Like, and then wh- when do you separate a short story from a novella? How come Ray Bradbury doesn't write novellas? Right. I think short stories are like under 50 pages. You know, maybe even like 25 or 30 at, at most. Hmm. Short stories could be only five pages. Short is relative. Okay? It is relative. You're well, right. You're the, right, Phil. Crime and Punishment is like a 700-page book. Let's talk about War and Peace. No, I was going to say, when you look at it as uh, short films versus feature length, there's some that get into that er- area, area, right? Yeah. I mean, there's some that like, come out, and it's like, well, it's an, hundred, you know, an hour and 10 minutes. And it's like, is it a feature length at an hour and 10 minutes? I believe so. I, I, it is. I I've, remember looking this up, but I think under an hour, you're going short film. Short film. But I don't think that's like a set rule. It's just more or less those are... It's a set rule at the Oscars, right? To qualify. Oh, yeah. When you're talking, I'm sure, and, and the Oscars have set Cut rules. Cut 100%, 100%. Right. But I'm saying like normally if, if a friend of ours was going to make a feature length movie and it came out to be an hour and you know three minutes, would we say, oh, that's a short film or not? Or are we that... It'd be a short feature. It'd be a featurette. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, when do we get a filmella? <laughs> right? What if that's what they should do? They should make a filmella adaptation no, of The Mist. To... <laughs> Good stuff. That's, that's, that's the word. Featurette. Um, before we exit the fish tank, did want to mention next week on the show, big review coming out. We are scheduled right now to be talking about Into the Spider Verse. Oh, yeah. The sequel to Spider Verse. Uh, what was the first one called? Into the Spider Verse. The, the second one now is called Across the Spider Verse. Right. All across the Spider Verse. This was on my list. My number one film that I most anticipated for for the summer. I am pumped. I am excited for this one. Wow, I'm happy, dude. I mean, I'm very stoked. I'm happy that you're so excited. Yes, can't wait to see this one. I think that's everything we have in the fish tank, is it? That's all we got this week. All right, jump back in there. You know it. Matt, in honor of the boogeyman, we are playing Stump the Kabinsky, five questions, and we are playing horror movie children. Okay. All right. I, I should be good at this, theoretically. Question number one over to you. Two famous child actors starred in the 1997 movie The Good Son. As Henry and Mark Evans, name them both. Macaulay Culkin and and um, uh, Frodo Baggins. Elijah Wood. Question two: Chloe Grace Moretz starred in the remake of this vampire movie in 2010. Oh, she was also in the remake of Carrie. But you're talking about Let the Right One In. That is correct. Or Let Me In, as her film was called. Yes. I was looking for Let the Right One In, so that's good. Um, two for two, Matt K. Question. I might know this category, actually. Well, I wrote extra questions just right. in case. See how good Matt is. You want all the questions? Maybe we'll, we'll see, go through we'll them all. all. Question right. three over to you. Isabel Furman starred as a 33-year-old woman that looks like a 12-year-old girl in this 2009 film. Wow. Okay. So now you've stumped me. All right. So Isabel Thurman? Isabel Furman. Furman. I don't know who she is. Starred as a 33-year-old woman that looks like a 12-year-old girl in this 2009 film. 2009? that the year? Mm Mm-hmm. It's got to be some kind of vampire movie, and we already talked about Let the Right One In. Um... And then it wouldn't be 33 looking like 12. Wow. Nah, I'm stumped on that one. Don't know. We were looking for The Orphan. Okay. Yeah. I got to catch up with those movies. I've not seen them. I know you like them a lot. I do. Matt is two correct, one incorrect as we move to question four. In the movie The Others, a mom tries to keep her two kids safe from strangers in the house. Who played the mom, Grace? Nicole Kidman. All right. He is rolling. He is rolling. Not stumped this week. Question five, last one over to you, Matt. Heather O'Rourke plays Carol Ann Freeling, who delivers the line, they're here in this 1980 classic. Wow. I'm going to keep going with my other questions. 
Question six over to you, because you're rowing, Matt. In 1999, the child actor, this child actor's performance earned him a Best Supporting Oscar nomination. 1989? 1999. This child actor's performance oh, um, earned him Best Haley, Supporting... Haley Joel Osmond. Yes. He was nominated for The Sixth Sense. He lost out to Michael Caine that year mm, for Cider well, House I'm Girls. glad Michael Caine won an yeah. Oscar. Uh, Even though nobody remembers that movie and everyone remembers The Sixth Sense. Question seven, Matt. Name the Oscar-winning actress who starred in the 2013 movie Mama. It was about two young sisters who go missing and are found alive five years later. I'm just going to guess um, uh, Julianne Moore. Jessica Chastain. Uh, wasn't there a German <laughs> film called Mama about like do? Two kids. Who, oh, like, that their was mom Good Night had... Mama. Good, good night, night Mommy. Mama. Good okay. Night Mommy. Good Night Mommy. That's a good one. That's awesome. That, That's they, what they, I thought they, you were talking about. They remade that in, uh, they did an Americanized they version. They did. Yeah. With, um, oh man, the Naomi Watts. Yeah. I haven't not seen it yet. I haven't seen it either. It's on Amazon Prime. You, I know you that. saw the original. Oh yeah. Good Night Mommy. Great one. All right. Last question to you, Matt. Ezra Miller plays Kevin in We Need to Talk About Kevin. Which actress played his mom? Tilda Swinton. Yeah, there you go. Well done, Matt. Well done. You wow. know your horror. I know my horror kids for some reason. So yeah, that's your there thing. You go. It is apparently, even though it scares the crap out of me. Can't stump Matt this week, but uh, I will say we had a lot of fun on this jaw. This was a good one. This was. I like getting together. We got a couple of beers going here. This is great. In the same room, Phil back in town. I it, know. It, 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 this is just fantastic. Unheard of. <laughs> it is. Brings us to the end of a great jaw. First and foremost, we want to thank Phil. Editor, producer, fill me in, Phil. Oh, you know it. I love it. I wouldn't be anywhere else with my two favorite boys talking movies and especially talking Stephen King. I feel like we talk about Stephen King a lot, and it's truly shocking that we have not done this yet. Agreed. You know what I mean? Like, like his I, scenes, you mean? Yeah. yeah uh, there's right. a bit of like shame on us that it's taken us 611 to finally get around to we, it. You got to leave some of those low-hanging fruit for us to pick off in the future. Right. You know? Right. I, We've I'm shot happy. ourselves in the foot when... Who knows what? Who knows what <laughs> other Stephen King is yet to be made a film out of? I but. know, right? Because that's going to happen next. When year. the girl who loves Tom Gordon finally gets that movie we've been waiting for, <laughs> the dome is coming out sooner or later. You know. We also want to thank our Patreons. Uh, thank you so much for supporting the show. If you're out there and you're listening to this and you want to support us, go over to patreoncom slash jaw. You can. Uh, help us out at any level that you feel comfortable and it would mean the world to us doing a lot of extras there yeah and you get access to our entire back catalog of of patreon extras that's enough reason to do it i think so yes we send you some cool christmas presents and we're stuff. also looking for reviews out there on apple itunes yeah. or wherever you're listening to this podcast that's another way you can support the show so get out there and, and uh, it's free right? it is you can just leave us five star review we'd like you to write a review but as long as you're putting in there that you've listened to cinema jaw it does help attract new listeners so. it helps out a ton yeah sure even does. if it's a one star i mean just let us whoa, know what whoa, you whoa, think. Whoa. yeah let's let's cut it out Dust off that quarter jaw. Give us one and a quarter. All right, one and a quarter. Until next week, I'm Ryan the Movie Guy. I'm Matt Kay. And, and keep, keep on jawing about the movies. movies.